Welcome to the Guide Exile. If you are watching this build guide after patch 3.5 Betrayal League, be sure to check the description, written guide, and pinned comments for updates on the build for its current viability. Some items, mechanics, or skill selections may change in between patches, thus the build can differ from the video. In the beginning of Betrayal League, one of my viewers, Rotcoil, suggested that I take a look at using the Disintegrator staff for an attack-based build, utilizing the recently buffed Tectonic Slam. This really sparked my interest because I didn't fully utilize the staff in the last build that I made with it, and figured a really strong build could be made out of it with all of the Shaper and Elder rare items that can be crafted, so I got to work on trying to plan something out. Now to start, we already have the disadvantage that we are not only using a two-hander weapon, but a staff at that. After some quick toying around the path of building, I was finding it tough to justify using Tectonic Slam since you really want to be able to scale attack speed, critical strikes, elemental conversion, and of course endurance charge maintenance. This made it really tough to build along with the restrictions of the Disintegrator staff as we need just about too much to make this work comfortably. In the end, after scouring through many different skills, I chose to finally use Earthquake due to its excellent scaling with slower attack speed along with not needing to convert and worry about any elemental penetration. As we did not need to worry about endurance charge management anymore, I was free in my ascendancy choice as well. Well, sort of. The Disintegrator staff still held me back in that regard. So to explain my ascendancy choice here, more than just wanting to relive the glory days of patch 2.3, let's take a look at the Disintegrator staff. The Disintegrator is a unique staff that drops from Uber Elder that has some very unique properties. To start, it has a very large physical damage base, with over 600 physical damage per second. Unfortunately, that physical damage is stuck on a staff, and a very slow staff at that. Staffs have generally poor damage nodes, along with a dismal pathing to get to them in the passive tree. However, the rest of the properties of the staff could make up for this. The main power of this staff comes from its provided siphoning charges which are gained on use of any skill. Siphoning charges grant the following per charge. Around 14 to 16 physical damage added to attacks and spells, 1% physical damage reduction from hits, 4% of non-chaos damage gained as chaos damage, 0.2% of damage leached as life, and 150 physical damage taken per second if a skill has been used recently. Additional maximum siphoning charges are gained for each Elder or Shaper item equipped, so to start with the staff, we will just have one maximum siphoning charge. These charges greatly amplify our offensive damage as well as giving us some reduction and utilities at the cost of taking physical damage over time whenever we use skills, which is all the time. So to start, we need to consider how we mitigate this as we have up to 7 siphoning charges. One of the best ways is just to regenerate faster than the degeneration, since there are so few sources of physical mitigation for physical damage over time that will be worth investing into. The best way that we can regenerate faster than degen is to invest into overleech with the duelist slayer or the scion ascendance slayer sub ascendancy, rather than actually invest into regular life regeneration. Much like the physical damage reductions to damage over time, the investment to get the same amount of life regeneration to leech rate is very expensive, if not close to impossible, due to leech's starting advantage of 20% of your life pool per second by default. This is why I chose to use the Duelist Slayer Ascendancy. It is underused, quite powerful, and overleech abilities are just so strong in comparison to the Ascendance overleech due to the overkill and life leech per second bonuses. In total, with all my investments into leech, I was able to get more than 115% of my maximum life pool leeched per second. And that, my friend, that is a lot of recovery. So with the main components of the build put together, let us venture into the full build summary here. I will not lie, this build is not cheap due to the use of all the Elder and Shaped bases. I would say that I spent somewhere around 15 exalts, not including the 2 socket Tomb Fists, which really aren't a requirement, but I chose to get them. But for me, it was a lot of fun min-maxing the different Elder and Shaper item slots, having the space to craft where I could. This justified the cost of the build for me, along with how well it performed. It can cover all the content with ease, all the way up through a Deathless Uber Elder. The main downside is the average AoE coverage of Earthquake, which maybe one day GGG will bring back to its glory screen-wide coverage. Offensively, we have the following. The Disintegrator Staff and its Siphoning Charges. This gives us our huge physical base, along with a lot of non-chaos damage gained as chaos. The way this stat works is it gives chaos damage at each stage of conversion, so with the use of physical gained as X element, we double dip with this. Earthquake. This is our main skill and a very solid choice at that. As mentioned before, scaling with slow attack speed due to the aftershock delay that we want to align with. Only one aftershock can exist at a time, so we want to trigger these one after another as close to their cooldown as possible. Critical strikes. As we want to bring the damage as high as we can, we go for critical strike scaling. This is also because Resolute Technique has a very low damage ceiling, since we have minimal staff scalers, and the staff nodes are already critical strike based. So we would just be throwing damage right out the window with that. 
Auras of Hatred, Herald of Ash, and War Banner. These are staple auras to be used on most all physical attack based builds, and they are very strong here. As I mentioned before, the siphoning charges non-chaos damage gained as chaos damage double dip here on the gain sources and conversion. So we will get non-chaos damage from the full physical base and from the gained elemental damage from Herald of Ash and Hatred. War Banner is an excellent choice to greatly improve our accuracy and physical damage. Now in my build, I was able to score an amulet with physical gained as fire and aspect of the spider, so I dropped my Herald of Ash for aspect of the spider. Ancestral Warchief and Vol Ancestral Warchief. Since we are a two-hander build, we have a second full six link which we can put a fully linked up Warchief in. This guy on his own deals some hefty damage along with boosting our own. A 20% life cull. From the Slayer, we gain a 20% cull, ending many boss fights such as Shaper, Guardians, Azaro, and map bosses much quicker in their last phases. And finally, we have Flasks. Flasks here are a big damage boost for all builds, and luckily for us, we can actually get a lot of damage with only having our Diamond Flask up. So these serve for some excellent burst damage. Defensively, we have the following. A Fortify. Due to our requirement of being melee range, along with using skills to maintain our siphoning charges, we will consistently be using Leap Slam and have a very high uptime on Fortify. Life Pool. We can garner a decent life pool here mainly through gearing, however if you so choose you can sacrifice some damage to get upwards of 6500 to 7000 life, and this is great because it also scales your leech rate. Next is leech rate. As we know with the slayer, the biggest part of our defense is our recovery rate. With all of the plus maximum leech rate in the tree and on items, along with vol pact, I garner around 68% of maximum life leeched per second. On top of this, we can also use a belt with percentage life recovery rate and the Arakali Pantheon for 70% increased life recovery rate total. With these all put together, we have a total of 115% of our maximum life leached per second. That is a massive amount of recovery rate right there. On top of the pure speed of the leech rate, these instances will last well near 2 minutes apiece. This means you can hit and kill a few monsters and still have this beefy leech for minutes on end without doing anything. And then again, finally we have flasks. As with the offensive section, we have some flasks to provide further defenses such as armor, physical damage taken as an element, resistance, and maximum resistance. The playstyle of this build is extremely straightforward, as it is in most attack builds. For mapping, we want to just engage Blood Rage, use the Writhing Jar to kill a few produced worms to start our Slayer Leech, then Leap Slam to packs of monsters, swig those flasks, and hold down your right click. Then you will rinse and repeat this throughout the map. For bosses, you want to do the same as you did for mapping, but now just drop your Ancestral and or Vol Ancestral Warchief, along with using your flasks appropriately. For endgame bosses, depending on their mods, you may have to move about and maintain Fortify, as our straight mitigations aren't huge, but our recovery from hits we survive is. The Path of Building Paste Bin is included within the written script and description. I chose to use the Slayer Ascendancy due to its massive strength and its overleech, utility of 20% cull, and because it's been widely underused. I also sort of secretly wanted to relive the old days of Slayer EQ. Now this build could be made as an Ascendant, but for that you really want to make use of Might of the Meeks and Unnatural Instinct, which is very expensive, and I wanted to keep this build somewhat affordable for what you see in the guide. And really, almost any build can be made great by using that dual setup with the Ascendant sub-Ascendancies. The first node, Headsman, is a strong but conditional node. It provides 20% more damage and 20% increased area of effect if we have killed recently. This luckily doubles up with our use of the Writhing Jar Worms on bosses, so it is still usable. It also makes us immune to physical reflected damage. Endless Hunger. This is an extremely strong node in that we gain 20% of our damage that we deal in an overkill leached as life. This means that with our huge hits, we gain an obnoxious amount of damage leached as life on normal mobs and Writhing Jar Worms. On top of this, we also gain immunity to bleeding. Brutal Fervor. This is the reason we choose Slayer. The life leech effects are not removed at full life, and we have 100% increased life leech per second. This stat is sort of confusing, but I explain it in my life leech mechanics video. Ultimately, 100% increased life leech per second, with no other modifiers on it, will effectively double the rate of the leech instance from 2% to 4% life per second, and double the amount of life that each instance recovers. However, they will remain the same amount of time, so in our case, this helps us reach our maximum life leech rate quicker. Bane of Legends. Finally, we have a 20% cull which can be used on almost all bosses. Along with this, we have a 20 second onslaught for killing rare and unique enemies, which is great for mapping speeds without the use of a silver flask. Here's the ascendancy progression. Here's the final passive tree. We get two keystones, Vol Pact. This is of course for doubling all of our leech rate stats. It's what makes our leech so quick at the loss of life regeneration, which we don't really need after we have killed at least one enemy. 
unwavering stance. This is really required to avoid getting stunned and chain stunned. Since we attack so slow, we are easily stunned during our attack animations and movement skill animations, which can result in a quick death. Getting this node frees us of that issue, since we cannot get the Brine King Pantheon or really justify the use of Combs Roots. You could also get the Overwhelm node from the Slayer Ascendancy, which I did try, but I felt it was a big waste over the 20% cull when we could just get Unwavering Stance at a slight health loss. For Bandits, you will want to help Alira. For the Major Pantheon, we of course choose Soul of Arakali. This is our biggest defensive advantage of the 50% increased life recovery rate. This Pantheon can be triggered by using a low-level cast one damage taken with an Immortal Call to quickly interrupt the physical damage over time from the Staff and Blood Rage. This means it's ultimately up all the time when we are taking any hit damage. For the Minor Pantheons, you can really use any of them that you see fit for this scenario. Here are the gem links for the build. They are listed in an order of importance. This is our main link setup. I found that Vol Earthquake was fairly useless with how much reduced earthquake duration we get, along with always leap slamming around rather than walking. I also chose to use increased critical strikes here to really bring up our critical strike chance since we hit so slowly that a missed critical strike is very noticeable. As with most all other area skills, swapping area of effect for mapping and concentrated effect for bosses is recommended. Now the links here are based on the chest you choose and it's biased towards coloring. In my case, I had a higher level hybrid armor evasion body armor with favor to dexterity. This meant I was more likely to get red and green sockets. Thus, I generally always got a green socket in my coloring, meaning that it was near impossible to get the right coloring for my earthquake links. Thus, I put my war chief in here. The best you can do here is open up path of building and check out which multipliers are best for your coloring options on your war chief if you do end up with it in your chest. So in my case of the build, I dropped Herald of Ash due to my amulet having aspect of the spider. If you so happen to get an aspect of the spider craft, you would use this setup. If you use a three socket pair of tomb fists or a rare pair of gloves, you could put your Herald of Ash in here and keep the ice golem from the previous link setup. If you do not have aspect of the spider, of course. For this build, you will most definitely want to have some gear planned and ready to go for the Disintegrator. However, you can get going on basic rare gear just fine with the Disintegrator or even a few average Elder or Shaper items. The Slayer's basic leech and base damage from the Disintegrator is plenty to carry you up to endgame on average rare gear around it, but ultimately the goal is to get as many Elder or Shaper items equipped as possible for all that extra damage from the siphoning charges. For the helmet, it is really tough to justify another choice over a Stakonjas. I've tried making some mock-up Elder and Shaper helmets in Path of Building, but none really wow me offensively or over a Starconjus. On top of this, it is generally really easy to find a Starconjus with reduced Earthquake duration on it. However, if you so choose, you can certainly Essence, Fossil, or Metacraft a rare Elder or Shaper helmet for life, accuracy, and resistances. For the body armor, I chose to reuse the armor from the Shattering Steel Deadeye, since it fit the exact same requirements that I needed. A lot of life and attacks get base critical strike chance, which is very helpful for shoring up our Earthquake's critical strike chance. If you cannot find or craft a decent Elder Rare Chest, a Belly of the Beast, Lore Weave, or another High Life Rare Chest are good options as well. For Gloves, it is certainly hard to argue against Tomb Fists for their utility and intimidate. I chose to go for the double socket since I wanted to invest into the build, but just started with the single socket variant. Both will work just fine. The benefit of the double socket is being able to socket a Searching Eye Jewel in here to always be maiming enemies, and of course having another jewel. A good unique alternative to these is a pair of Shaper's Touch, possibly corrupted with Critical Strike Chance. Otherwise, you can look for a rare Elder or Shaper-based glove with life, attack speed, and flat damage. For boots, you'll want to try and get as much life, movement speed, and resistances as possible on an Elder or Shaper base. I originally started with no movement speed boots, but I found it really too sluggish and swapped to some movement speed boots. Surprisingly, I ended up paying more for the no movement speed boots, and they had around the same or worse life than my current boots. Go me. Here's where we can start getting some good Elder affixes. These belts can get quite expensive, and I spent roughly around 3 exalts on this one, which has flat life, percentage increase life, and percentage increase life recovery rate, along with some percentage increase damage modifiers. Overall, I would say I got this for a steal. I would highly recommend looking for one, at least with life and life recovery rate on it, as your main affixes. The amulet is another spot where we can score some nice Elder affixes. Here we want to prioritize getting maximum life leech rate, as this value is doubled with Vol Pact. 
On top of this, there is also percentage of physical damage gained as fire damage, and non-chaos damage gained as chaos, just like on siphoning charges. Beyond these elder affixes, there are also other great affixes such as critical strike multiplier, accuracy, flat damage, increased damage, and of course life. As I mentioned before, I was able to find this amulet for around two exalts with the spider craft on it, so I chose to use this over Herald of Ash. This craft is in no way required, just something I came across. For the rings, we could use a Mark of the Elder setup, but I found that my elemental resistances were far too strained for this. So I sought to get rare Elder Rings with life and percentage increase melee damage to get around the same damage increases as an Elder Ring, without the flat damage, which really pans out to a small amount of damage with all of the siphoning charges that we have. Finally, we have the Disintegrator as our weapon. This is of course what the build is made around, and is key to our damage with its massive physical base damage and siphoning charges. Another thing to note is in Betrayal League, you can get Hillock to rank 3 in Transportation Wing, to craft a weapon to 28% quality. This means you can get even better damage by bringing the Disintegrator to 28% quality, like I have done here. Here are the flasks for the build. A Diamond Flask for our Critical Strike Chance, Lion's Roar for the more melee damage multiplier and extra armor, at Ziri's Promise, this is much like the Siphoning Charges as it provides us more Chaos damage on our physical base damage and gained as sources. A Sulfur Flask. This flask slot is quite interchangeable as we need a Magic Flask for Curse Immunities. Since we have Unwavering Stance, Blind does not do anything for us, so Stib Knight is out. We also do not need Onslaught, so a Silver Flask is out. So we could really use a Defensive Flask like a Basalt, or an Offensive Flask like a Sulfur Flask for the increased damage, even though we can't regenerate from the Consecrated Ground. When I do endgame bosses or maps that do not have curses on them, I prefer to swap this with a Taste of Hate that has more damage and increased defenses on it. A Writhing Jar. Finally we have the Writhing Jar. Whilst this flask really recovers next to no life, it provides us two small worms that have minimal life and that we can heavily overkill to start off our leech such that we do not need a life flask and count as our recently killed conditional. For jewels, I will show examples used in my build within the video and leave affix priority in the written guide. The one unique jewel that I use in this build is the Tempered Mind. This is an excellent jewel to place in the jewel socket to the left of the Templar above the Devotion node. Here it provides 500 flat accuracy which greatly improves both our hit and critical strike chances and removes the necessity to get flat accuracy on all of our gear. For rare jewels we really just want to look for life and a lot of critical strike multiplier. We also need at least one jewel with percentage of physical damage leached as mana to maintain our mana pool as I have chosen to save a point in the passive tree that was originally getting mana leech. For Abyss Jewels, our best scalers are really flat life, global critical strike multiplier, and attack speed, since we have so much flat damage already. For information on leveling, check out the written guide. Well, I don't know about you Exile, but this build was sure nostalgic back to the glory days of Earthquake and Slayer along with turning out very strong in the current patch. This build performs well throughout all of the game's content, was a breeze to level, and was very fun to gear, scouring the market and crafting the right items. Overall, I was very pleased with the build and would recommend it to anybody looking to play some Earthquake or explore an attack-based Disintegrator build, as that weapon is really quite underutilized. So as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, Exile.